Hello? Oh, <laughs> okay. I wasn't expecting it to be that loud. Right, uh, we're going to make a start in, uh, in just a minute, so if anyone still needs to take a seat. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this uh, side event uh, on observing and understanding climate change and biodiversity from the coast to the deep ocean. So this session is organized by POGO, the Partnership for Observation of the Global Ocean, and the University of Southampton. And we uh, are partnering with various uh, programs that are led by, by these two organizations and others, uh, which include the Ocean Biomolecular Observing Network, OBON, uh, Marine Life 2030, the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, and the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy. So just to introduce you to the scope of this session, um, we'll, we'll be talking about um, or the, the global networks that I've just mentioned will be discussing how developing capacity for observing and understanding marine ecosystems will support tracking, forecasting, and stewardship of these ecosystems to address the intertwined threats of climate change and biodiversity loss from the coast to the deep ocean. This session will emphasize the importance of biological observations, their importance for ocean and climate, and the need to link observations to policy making. So to introduce our fantastic lineup of speakers, I'll just uh, give you a, a quick overview and then I'll introduce them individually as they start their presentations. Uh, so just to introduce myself, I'm Sophie Siave. I'm the CEO of the Partnership for Observation of the Global Ocean, POGO. And then on our panel, we have uh, Veronica Rilano from the University of British Columbia, Vancouver in Canada. We have Margaret Leinen from Scripps Institution of Oceanography in the US. Sarah Seabrook from the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research in New Zealand. Then we'll have a virtual speaker, Pierluigi Buttigieg from the uh, joint Alfred Wegener Institute and Guillaumar Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration. And then back in the room, we'll have Natalie Hilmi from the um, Centre Scientifique de Monaco, Lisa Levin, uh, also from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and finally, Sonigitu Ekpe from um, the Department of Environmental Multilateral Support and Cooperation at the State Ministry of Environment in Calabar, Nigeria. So the, uh, I won't go into the, the details now of each presentation, but we have a lineup of seven short presentations, which will be followed by some discussion and opportunity for the audience online and in the room to ask questions. So, without further ado, um, I will hand you over to uh, Veronica um, Rilano. <laughs> I'll just introduce you briefly. Uh, so, Veronica recently graduated with a PhD in Oceans and Fisheries from the University of British Columbia. She's interested in marine conservation, connectivity, and the socio-ecological issues resulting from the mismanagement of marine resources. Her research aims to understand how to better communicate conservation actions to a broader audience to achieve change on the ground. And in this session, she's representing the Ocean Decade Program, Marine Life 2030. And we'll also talk about her project, um, Somos Oceanos, Ocean Stories for Conservation, which explores the needs of people living in and around the so-called marine, uh, paper marine protected areas. Over to you, Veronica. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my name is Veronica Relaño. And well, I wanted to start with a beautiful picture because for some of us, this is the beach of our dreams. Um, for others, it's a place to call home. And currently, there, are, there is 2.4 billion people that live within 100 kilometers of the coastline. And many depend on healthy oceans. However, the state of our oceans, as we all know, is not as pristine as we imagine. For example, the fish we ate when we were young, more, um, most probably is less available now. 
So, well, one third of marine mammals and nearly one third of sharks are threatened with extinction. And there are many tools for conservation, and one of them is marine protected areas, MPAs. Right now, the ocean decade acknowledge that the ocean holds the keys to an equitable and sustainable planet. And we have the motto that we all know, the science we need for the ocean we want. But however, currently, there is no systematic effort coordinated internationally to observe life in the sea. And here is where Marine, Marine Life 2030, a program that is endorsed by United Nations, Ocean Decade, is trying to, to solve. So the, the goal is enable efforts to characterize how marine biodiversity is changing. The problem here is that sometimes these programs or research initiatives, or most of us, forget about how local community knowledge could help to characterize actually this, marine biodiversity, and spot certain challenges. So this is where my, pro my project, Somos Oceanos, which is part of Marine Life 2030, is trying to do. It's trying to um, empower coastal communities, inform governance, and improve healthy uh, marine ecosystems. And all that using science communication, or in this case, the channel I used was a documentary. So the protection status of our oceans. If in this image we see 100 fish, only one, two, three, three of them will be fully protected from fishing activities. And this still doesn't guarantee anything. So that's why I was really interested in marine protected areas, and especially the ones that don't work, the so-called paper marine protected areas. So this is part of the, this is what drove me to do this kind of project and try to understand the communities that live within paper marine protected areas and how they suffer the mismanagement of marine resources. I went to one of these paper marine protected areas in the north of Argentina, in Patagonia, and I tried to understand the problems of the people, try to get in the community and do like really genuine conversations with them. And all that uh, went into the format of that documentary. Of course, sometimes I have more than two hours of conversation that could not go in a 40 minutes documentary. But the idea was to show a very uh, objective way of how they are living in these spaces when there is no a real governance there. Some of the quotes and the perceptions, it was, well, not everyone participates in decision making, and we don't conserve the MPA, the Marine Protected Area, together. And the main idea with this was not just to do a documentary and bring it to Canada, it was to show it to the community, to share it, so they could be even more involved and feel how the neighbors were feeling, because sometimes we are scared of expressing our feelings and saying how bad we are in, in a place. But if the rest are also expressing the, that in the same way, we feel like we are creating a greater community because not all the actors are the same. They don't think in the same way, but we need to listen. And this was one of the main objectives of the, of the documentary, to create a greater community to push for more conservation. And for example, in this case, to participate in the revision of the management plan that should have occurred this year. Um, so with this in mind, I just want to say that in the next years, um, with the Ocean Decade, I will keep demonstrating the power of science communication to raise awareness in places that suffer from mismanagement of marine resources. And let's just not forget that regardless of where we live, we all depend on healthy oceans. Thank you very much. If you want to know more about the project, I left some flyers at the end of the room. Thank you. That was excellent timekeeping. Thank you so much. OK. so. We are going to move on now to um, 
presentation on the uh, UN Ocean Decade Program, OBON, uh, which will be given by Margaret Leinen, who's the director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Uh, she's an award-winning oceanographer and distinguished national and international leader in ocean science, global climate, and environmental issues. She's a co-chair of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development Advisory Board and chair of the Science Advisory Council for the OBON program, which she'll now tell us a bit more about. Over to you. Thank you, Sophie. And thank you, Veronica, for starting us out with the people that depend on this ocean and biodiversity. So we're going to uh, take a, a little dive into that biodiversity. And I'm going to tell you about the Ocean Biomolecular Observing Network. So this is a, a, an effort that was uh, originated from discussions at the Partnership for Observation of the Global Ocean and they are our lead organization. The, the network depends on the fact that every organism in the ocean, from microbes to mer the largest marine mammals, shed biomolecules, DNA and other biomolecules, into the water, whether that's through metabolic waste, shedding mucus or, or scales, uh, or uh, shedding uh, this material when they die. The, that means that the water in that area holds a record of everything that lives in and affects it. And by measuring the biomolecules in the water, we can take a census of everything from microbes to marine mammals. And we can do so without having to capture those organisms, whether it's capturing them physically or capturing them on cameras or capturing their acoustic signature with sound. So this gives us a great tool, a very powerful tool, for first establishing baseline senses of various areas, and then through time, being able to see the change in the biological community and how it is related to anthropogenic and climate change. The objectives of OBAN are then first to build this coastal to open ocean multi-omics biodiversity observing system and to develop autonomous sampling capability and analysis uh, capability. So we started with working with organizations that are already have time series observations of bio, biomolecules or were, were newly funded to do that. So we have about uh, 15 projects that are official projects of the Ocean Decade that are part of OBAN. And you can see all of the green locations on this map are already measuring time series of ocean biomolecular uh, uh, observations. So you can see that we've got a start, uh, and this is after about a year. Uh, so we are actively soliciting new projects that are engaged in this kind of observation. And you'll also see that everything's on the coast. Uh, we don't have open ocean uh, observations yet. The, uh, so the, one of the second things we want to do is to foster the development especially of environmental DNA methods, which depend on establishing primers for various species so that we can work toward those measurements being quantitative rather than just the, the, uh, the qualitative existence of that organism influencing the water, but how much of that organism is present. And uh, of course this is this is being looked at as something that would develop over the decade and allow us to look at things like fish stock assessment or uh, assessment of organisms in marine protected areas as a quantitative tool. Uh, in addition, we want to develop the technology not only to sample that by people going out and doing it at a, at a station, but also autonomously. There are already three technologies for autonomous collection of samples 
for biomolecular analysis. And what we want to do now is develop over the decade the ability for autonomous vehicles to not only sample, but perform the biomolecular uh, analyses on the vehicle itself. So if you're familiar with the Argo program, which uh, gives us uh, physical information about the ocean, think about, uh, after a decade, a biological Argo that actually tells us, uh, that actually measures biodiversity in the open ocean. You're going to hear more about enhancing the omics data system. And uh, Pierre Buttigieg, who is going to talk to us later, is going to tell you more about uh, the idea of how to give people the tools to completely characterize their myomolecular analyses in terms of metadata, to easily get them into uh, biomolecular uh, data systems, and to be able to link that data to physical uh, oceanography as well. And finally, building capacity to do this. Uh, we're already working uh, with Atlantico's mission micro microbiomes. Uh, it's an expedition that is, is connecting uh, uh, scientists from Africa and from Latin America uh, to resources in Europe and uh, conducting biomolecular analyses in all of the locations you see here. And our, our goal is, over the decade, to work with development and aid agencies to make this capability uh, available everywhere. So that's Oban, and uh, if you're interested, if you're already doing biomolecular observations, let us know, and if you're interested, you can follow us. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, thanks also for keeping to time. OK. So we're now going to dive into the deep ocean with Sarah Seabrook telling us about deep sea biology and its relationship with climate. Um, she's going to provide some perspectives from the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative program. Sarah is an oceanographer at the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research in New Zealand. Her research focuses on understanding how changes in the ocean environment impact the structure and function of ecosystems. She helps to lead the climate working group of DOCI, where she works to highlight the ocean climate nexus. Sarah, over to you. Thank you. This video here is from a methane seep 2,000 meters down in the ocean off of Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I work. Um, and it's just up here just to show us all how much complexity and how much really amazing um, life exists down in these deep waters. The ocean is our greatest climate regulator. It has taken up 90% of the heat accumulated from greenhouse gas emissions by humans, and it has been a sink for around 25% of the carbon dioxide emitted by human activity. While this has been a great service provided by the ocean, keeping the planet tens of degrees cooler than it would have been otherwise, it has come at a cost. The excess heat and carbon that the ocean has been absorbing has called, caused rampant warming, acidification, and deoxygenation across the ocean with multifaceted, often cumulative, impacts across ocean depths. For these next few minutes, we will explore what this means for life in the deep sea. The average global temperature of the ocean has been increasing consistently with warming across ocean depths. This causes direct impacts on deep sea life. For example, much of the life in the deep sea is used to extremely stable, slow-changing environments. Ocean warming is changing that, and that is changing the metabolism and respiration of deep sea animals, as well as their reproductive success. Warming also increases ocean stratification, and this disturbs ocean biogeochemistry. There are so many truly amazing, complex processes happening all the time across the ocean depths, transporting food and nutrients from surface to seafloor, with this indicated in the figure on the left. And these are all impacted in different ways. 
some of these changes that we are seeing have impacts for food transport to ocean depths. These impacts to food transport can manifest in less food delivery to the deep sea, with modeling predictions conducted under high emission scenarios indicating that this would cause a 10% reduction in deep sea biomass by the year 2100. Warmer water also holds less oxygen, and this is leading to deoxygenation in every ocean basin. Since 1960, there has been a 2% average global loss in ocean oxygen, with up to 40% loss in some regions. To put this into context, when we humans go up to high altitude places like Mount Everest, we have to use oxygen masks to make up for the 30% less oxygen in these environments. Similarly, many animals in the deep sea cannot survive in low oxygen conditions. Some mobile animals can relocate to parts of the ocean that are outside expanding or emerging oxygen minimum zones, but sessile animals such as corals, barnacles, sponges that don't move, they cannot escape. This excess carbon uptake by the ocean is also causing ocean acidification or a reduction in the alkalinity or pH of seawater. This decreases the habitability range for calcifying organisms, with some again trying to relocate and others such as deep sea corals unable to relocate. Ocean acidification also impacts the survivability of larvae across ocean depths and degrades the structural basis of some deep sea ecosystems. Many calcifying organisms provide some of the only complex structure in deep sea habitats, and when these are impacted by ocean acidification, this feeds back to other life that depends on that structure. Last, I would be remiss to not talk about the muddy seafloor. Many people see a scene like this and think that there's nothing much going on but flat mud, but as a biogeochemist that loves the mud, uh, this is what I see. Complex interactions facilitated by life in the deep sea that extend throughout the sediment surface and which have been and will continue to be impacted by climate change. As we move from baseline conditions shown on the left of this figure to impacted conditions indicated on the right, we see lots of changes that will occur to the magnitude and the mechanisms of carbon and nitrogen cycling among other things. These sediments are one of the biggest sinks for carbon in the world, and so this really, really matters. Okay, so what can we do to preserve life, complexity, nursery grounds, important ecosystem functions, and productivity in deep sea habitats? Well, the clearest, most immediate thing is to reduce emissions. In IPCC modeling, we can clearly see that the lower emission scenarios, indicated in blue on these graphs and pointed out by the arrows, in these scenarios, every ocean impact is less. There are less marine heat wave days, the ocean heat content is lower, the ocean pH is higher, and the oxygen content is higher. And the greater the emissions cut, the greater the impact. It's not too late for the ocean, and the sooner we act, the sooner we implement policies to reduce emissions, the better things will be. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. You, you caught me by surprise there. I wasn't quite ready to stand up yet. You were so quick. Okay, so now we are going to have a virtual speaker joining us. Fingers crossed, um, it, will, it will all work out. Sorry. Okay, so we've heard from the previous speakers about all these programs that are generating large volumes of data. But how do we actually ensure that different uh, types of data are compatible and available to stakeholders and policymakers? Pierluigi uh, Buttigieg, our next speaker, will be talking about interoperability of biodiversity data, especially microbiome and biomolecular data. Pierluigi is a digital knowledge steward and senior data scientist at the Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration. He's involved in multiple regional and international research data infrastructures and actions within the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Um, I'm not entirely sure if he's online, is he? I am. Ah, he is online, okay. Okay, so uh, we're looking at your slides. Um, please just let me know when you want me to move them along. 
Oh, great. Am, I am, am I in control of them or you? Oh, you are, right? Yeah, we, we can't see you, but we can hear you. That's fine. Let's save bandwidth. Um, so, um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, being here. And I'll certainly pick up where others have left off. Naturally, um, all of these initiatives and marine life in general, it, observing marine life produces a huge amount of data and very varied data. And I think now is the time that we need to get that in order in order to then participate in more consolidated reporting of how life on our planet is changing under changing climatic conditions. Uh, next slide, please. One thing to understand about biodiversity, um, just a note, I can't actually see my slides. The camera needs to zoom out a little bit, but I'll get and we'll see where we go. So biodiversity metadata themselves, and you can click through, uh, Sophie, to see the, the points. It's important to understand what they are before we uh, kick off. Um, they are the story of our natural heritage. They are the record that we keep about what we have seen, what kind of life forms inhabit our planet under its varying conditions, and what we're doing to them. It's not just a um, retrospective thing, of course. We need that information to predict how life will change as the planet changes. It's also important to understand that biodiversity data are deep data. Every data point has a rich story behind it. How you got down to the deep sea to observe that strange new fish species, how you understood what biomolecules are telling you. There's a lot of metadata. There's a lot of information that goes with each data point. So in a sense, we need much more robust metadata systems to explain what values mean. It is also very, very multidisciplinary. Um, there are many uh, um, disciplines that go into observing life, as uh, Margaret has said, also acoustic sequencing, uh, satellite uh, telemetry. It's to say biodiversity data is saying many things at the same time. And it's important to understand the complexity of that situation. It's also vital to understand that this data is kept and stewarded by very different kinds of people. Different communities and different cultures have valuable biodiversity information, um, including indigenous groups and, and of course, uh, large-scale space observation initiatives. And combining that is going to be a challenge that requires uh, an openness and a flexibility when we come to designing systems. Overall, however, um, it is still highly fragmented. The data that we're dealing with is siloed away, not because of, let's say, a lack of effort, of course. It's just because of the complexity of the challenge. And we need to muster new resources to then face that challenge. Um, moving on to the next slide. Right. It's good to know that there are digital infrastructures uh, that are operational. And these digital infrastructures are doing quite a lot. There are far too many to mention uh, by name things in order piece by piece, region by region, nation by nation. They're taming the digital wilds, if you will, and developing gradually our global capacity to then address and report on biodiversity change. They, of course, provide key insights to their stakeholders in their regions or the stakeholders that they're most in touch with. However, there is still the challenge of getting them to interoperate or work together at a global scale, at a planetary scale. It has been success but there's so much more underneath that uh, we need to address. So a little vision here, um, picking through, the key here, the key ingredient is that all of this has to be robust and flexibly interoperable. That means when somebody sends a query off to one of their favorite data systems, and click through, Sophie, I think the animations will do the rest. Um, it sh that data system itself should then pass on the query to other systems that they may not even know about. Very similar to how the internet works today. When you send in a search to your favorite search provider, often very complex things happen in the background, but the answer you get is a synthesis of many different queries. We need to promote that interoperability on the infrastructural level to help people get the answers they need to make the decisions they need to, make, to do the research that they need. Currently, you still have to hunt for the right portal for the right task. And I think that's the game we have to change. Um, the note there is that we often hear this term, there's a one-stop shop for data. Uh, this is a bit of a misnomer. That's always talking about the front end. But we really need to focus a little bit more on the back end, the global supply chain of data. Who's importing it, who's sharing it, and who can pick it up? Right, moving along. We also have to recognize, then, that there are different stakeholders that are going to be querying the same system. So you can click through, Sophie. Right. There will be different stakeholders querying the same system. 
Um, and one of the things for future robustness and also sustainability is that that experience that they have will be very different, a scientist to a policymaker to a member of the general public, but the underlying architecture should be the same. That's the way that we create this thing in a sustainable way. So that's the sort of digital transformation that we're going to need. Some basic principles means putting the data first as a first hustle. It's not just the communications and the papers that we write, but the data itself has a legacy. The more we invest in making sure that's of high quality, the more integration and synthesis the infrastructures can do and the more important uh, reporting we can have. We need to get the data, the metadata and data in shape first before we start worrying about the tooling. And that is how we make sure that many tools can use the same data. That requires a set of robust standards uh, and they need to be technically sound and also connect with the research being done. And we also have to use this linked open data model that Margaret uh, alluded to, where we can connect things over the web to uh, many, many stakeholders at the same time. Of course, biodiversity doesn't exist in a vacuum. We need to integrate that with other kinds of ocean data, uh, which is often our metadata, and bringing those worlds together will make things far more robust and will require a measure of digital diplomacy, where agreements will be stuck, struck at a high level that will precipitate down to a, a technical level. Um, to put it in one sort of phrase, this is what Terry McConnell said at our uh, Digital Twins meeting, a G7 meeting we had. When we want to build our sparkly fountains, our very impressive data solutions, our digital twins, our models, we need to do the plumbing first. And I think we're there currently, and we need to put a lot more effort um, into making this happen. But the opportunity is immense, and the challenge is certainly uh, we can take it on. And we have the right team. So closing. The UN Ocean Decade provides us with initiatives like OBAN, Marine Life, DOSI, and IDUS to bring the expertise together with the data experts um, engineering this digital system, doing the plumbing, creating the interfaces. So I think we have this chance and we have the global call to answer. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I, hopefully you'll, you'll stay on uh, for the questions and discussion uh, that will follow at the end of the presentations. Okay, so now we're going to shift our focus towards the socio-economic side of marine ecosystems, and in particular, blue carbon solutions. Natalie Hilmi is an expert in macroeconomics and international finance. She's section head of environmental economics um, at at the Centre, Centre Scientifique de Monaco and has worked on evaluating the socio-economic extent of impacts and costs of action versus inaction with regard to carbon emissions. She's lead author for the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate and also for the working group two um, six assessment report, which is upcoming. She will tell us about how marine ecosystems contribute to climate change mitigation by sequestering excess carbon from the atmosphere. Natalie, over to you. Hello. Uh, I'm happy to talk to today about the blue carbon solutions to uh, sequester the excess carbon from the atmosphere. We know that the ocean plays a key role in global climate regulations through uptake and storage of heat and uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, in uh, October two 2021, uh, the Scientific uh, Center of Monaco organized a workshop and uh, the topic was uh, especially about uh, blue carbon and nature-based solutions. For that, we uh, redefine the term of blue carbon to uh, consider not only coastal blue carbon, but also the open ocean and the deep sea. So we completed the definition that was uh, in the SROC, the special report uh, on the ocean and the atmosphere. And uh, we also redefined the, the nature-based solutions. We took the definition by IUCN and uh, we completed it uh, to see how they address societal challenges uh, and uh, adapt adaptability. So one group studied the temperate and coastal, um, the tropical temperate coastal ecosystems, and uh, 
the, the objective was to understand the science and to take it until the socioeconomic impact. The second uh, group was about open water and the deep sea ecosystems. And uh, this was really very important to consider also these spots that have not been considered in the S-Rock. So I will take the example of uh, one uh, important uh, m m blue carbon ecosystem like mangroves to, to tell you that we can give it a value. Uh, we, we know that ecosystem services are divided into four categories, provisioner, provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural services. So we can give them a value, and there are already some studies that have been done for that. Uh, the, the, the issue is uh, that for the moment, those values uh, are not really very clear because we don't know the methodology that have been used. So now we are going to combine them and to see what are the gaps in the methodology. So th this is example of mangroves, but we can also do the same for other ecosystem, uh, blue carbon ecosystems. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we know that uh, we, if we take the ecosystem services, we can transform them into uh, natural capital and put them on the balance sheets of the countries. And instead of using only GDP, we can use the new uh, way to calculate the wealth of the nations. And if we include their natural capital, they will be much richer than what they are now, especially the developing countries that are very rich in natural capital. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Natalie. I think my timer is going to go off again because you, you finished uh, ahead of time. OK, so we've heard about how biological observations are important and how the data are being made available to stakeholders as well as how important marine ecosystems are for society, as you've just heard. But to tie all of this together, we need to ensure that the data we are gathering are being used to inform policy making. So Lisa Levin will now talk about bringing deep ocean observations to international policy. Lisa is a distinguished professor emeritus at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego. She researches the ecology of different ecosystems on deep continental margins, their vulnerability to climate change, and to human resource extraction. She helps lead both DOSI and the uh, DEUCE, Deep Ocean Observing Strategy, bringing deep sea science to policymakers. Lisa has been a voice for deep sea science in IPCC and World Ocean Assessment. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So I want to continue with the theme of the deep sea that Sarah raised and remind us that the deep ocean is 95% uh, of the ocean. So most of the ocean is deep. A whole lot of it, almost two thirds, sits in international waters. And our theme today is ocean observing. And um, I put up here a lot of the different motivators for observing the deep ocean. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with most of these. Resource extraction, managing that requires observations. Creating baseline data requires observations. Early warning hazards require observations. And of course, understanding climate change and figuring out what to do about it also requires deep ocean observations. And we have a number of different scientific networks that have focused on deep ocean observing. One of these is the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy, DEUCE. Um, and the goal of DEUCE is to cultivate a globally integrated network of networks to observe the deep ocean effectively in support of science policy and planning for sustainable oceans. And DEUCE basically is a coordinating body. You can might not be able to read them all, but there's, there's many, many different observing systems that are a part of the DEUCE network. They include observing and exploration networks. They include data and modeling and cyber infrastructure networks, and then um, organizations focused on managing, management and policy. And DEUCE brings these uh, different organizations together 
uh, to set requirements, that is, what should we be observing in the deep ocean, to impl help implement that observing in a coordinated way, and to translate deep ocean data into, uh, into a form that policymakers can use. The other uh, observing network that's uh, biologically focused, I'd like to mention, is, is the Challenger 150 program. And I should mention both DEUCE and Challenger 150 are Decade for Ocean Science programs. So Challenger 150, associated with DOCI, is targeting coordination of deep sea biological research globally towards a set of common objectives. They have a set of technical scientific research working groups and are currently forming a set of regional scientific research working groups to coordinate uh, basically biological and ecosystem characterization of the deep sea with a focus on the deep sea floor. Now we know that ocean life plays a really critical role in the carbon cycle. It, it transports, it transforms carbon, it, um, it stores carbon and it sequesters carbon and all, a lot of this uh, ends up in the deep ocean. And so we know how important biological observing can be to understand these processes. But I have to say, and I think we all know, that deep biological observing lags far behind ocean physics and chemistry. So we have a new deep Argo program, but maybe someday we'll have an eco deep Argo program that can measure eDNA in the deep sea. We have seabed 2030, but maybe uh, which map, maps the seafloor, but maybe someday we will be mapping all the ecosystems and habitats of the seafloor. We have a great go ship program. I'd love to see them focus on biodiversity. They're, they have the potential to do that. And I think there's a lot of advancements in um, a artificial intelligence analysis of video that can now be applied to helping us observe the deep sea. So our challenge is how to build the deep sea into uh, deep observing and how to move those observations to inform uh, high seas and deep sea policy. And we know climate change is particularly important. I would argue that all the organizations that I've depicted on uh, on the side of this diagram, all, um, these UN bodies that manage in international waters all need to be paying attention to climate change. And I want to give just three short examples of how, this can, how we should be doing this. One is that we need to be managing our deep sea fisheries under climate change. We've done an analysis that shows that the commercially harvested deep sea species that um, are at the greatest climate risk are also the same species uh, at the greatest uh, vulnerability for, for uh, overfishing. And we need to be building climate change into management, including management of the vulnerable marine ecosystems that these fish depend on um, to grow and be healthy. A second uh, approach or important role of biological observing in the deep sea is for baseline studies. Um, these baseline studies are required for environmental impact assessments and the development of ocean health indicators, um, and they are required by the International Seabed Authority for um, development of exploit exploitation contracts. They're required by regional fisheries management organizations for the development of new fisheries, and um, uh, if the BBNJ treaty that's being negotiated now at the UN um, is successful, they will also be required for a host of other activities um, that people might carry out in the open and ocean and deep sea. And then a final uh, focus, I think, should be building climate resilience into protected area design, uh, including in the deep ocean. And uh, right now, we have a whole series of EBSAs ecologically and uh, biologically significant areas that have been designated um, by the Convention on Biological Diversity, but only one of these even focuses or targets climate change. And we know I have a map of hazards in the Clarion Clipperton zone where there are uh, over 20 mining contracts. And the main point there is there's a lot of heterogeneity and projected climate change, and we need to be building that into our planning for the protected areas that the Seabed Authority establishes. 
We know that MPAs designed for bio, to preserve biological diversity also provide climate mitigation, resilience, and adaptation. There's a great new paper on this specific subject. And my final message is that we need to be managing climate and biodiversity together for effective deep ocean policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. So for our final presentation, we'll look to the future and to the next generations of leaders. Sonigitu Azibong Ekpe is Scientific Director of the Department of Environmental Multilateral Support and Cooperation at the State Ministry of Environment, Calabar, Nigeria. He's also a Senior Research Associate at the Global Institute for Food, Nutrition and Health in Cambridge in the UK. And he's a member of the DOSI Climate Change Working Group and the Digital Sequence Information Scientific Network. He engages in bridging and connecting different values, sides, cultures, and interests to support the blue economy. So he's now going to talk about the need to prepare young leaders to address the climate change crisis and inform policy through capacity development, governance, open data, and climate change mitigation. Good afternoon, Rob. Yeah. I think we need to start with a quote. A team is not a group of people who work together. It's a group of people who trust each other. We need to stand up for science by strengthening trust among the scientific community to support the next generation leaders. Why? Because we have a lot of misinformation that has led to disinformation. And the policy guys with the business stakeholders are playing with the planet. So today, we are all here from multidisciplinary fields with different expertise as politicians, business leaders, scientists, and activists trying to slow a crisis that is almost incomprehensible in its mission. We all may be aware that the marine rim is the largest, as explained by my colleagues here. So we need to move through an adaptation strategy and science-informed policy response to global change, which are urgently needed. However, despite the convening and commitment over the years, many across the globe still lack the ability to agree on what is fact versus friction, even when it comes to science. The next generation leaders need to facilitate candid conversations that bring together diverse experts by providing a space where people can build trust and share their perspective on overcoming ideological differences. Global leaders should encourage the science community, the public, and the policy makers to think beyond business as usual and aspire for real change, while catalyzing major investment in ocean science, as well as stimulate research agenda at the national level by aligning science priorities with national commitments. The level of knowledge of the ocean that is currently produced and in the way we manage cooperation and partnership in support of sustainable development and healthy ocean is guiding the first step to be taken in terms of removing, adapting, and mitigating recognized impacts. The way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. The pillars of trust, the three eyes, the individual. There is great value when people from different backgrounds come together to exchange ideas. The institution. We must repair broken institutions by taking into account community need and well-being in order to build trust, especially the government and the media. You don't know who to trust. Information. Let's create one shared policy reality. We should help people navigate complex society issues and learn to separate facts from friction. Summary. 
we need to raise awareness on the truly global dimension of the ocean, demonstrating that its well-being affects people globally and locally at sea, on the coast, and inland. Unlocking the innovation potential from the ocean should be an important trust. Gaps in human and institutional capacity and lack of resources need to be bridged. Collecting and disseminating data according to agreed international standards and building technical capacity inclusively will help us. We have so much capacity in the global north. Can that be properly synergized within the global south? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanigitu. Okay, so we have uh, one of our panelists who needs to leave uh, for the airport fairly soon. So uh, I think what we'll do is open up for uh, questions from the audience, first of all. Um, and then if I, I can also ask my, my questions and then if you need to go, uh, you're free to go. So. Um, Hopefully someone is monitoring if there are any online questions, but in the meantime, are there any questions from the floor for any of our panelists? Yeah. Uh, is there a microphone? Um, my name is Kira and I study deep sea biology. Um, I was just curious with the mention of carbon sequestration um, in the ocean and the carbon cycle, I wanted to know what you all's opinions were on um, using the deep ocean as like a carbon sink at, to mitigate climate change um, and how that will affect biodiversity. Thank you for the question. Who would like to have a go at that? Sarah? Uh, can you hear me okay? This one? This one. I'll just get close. I think it's working now, yeah? Okay. Thanks for the question here. That's a really good point, and I think we're hearing a, about that a lot here. We're trying to figure out how can we take advantage of the fact that the ocean can trap a lot of carbon and maybe try and accelerate that. But I think that we should have precaution when we're considering these ideas. The ocean, as we were mentioning in our talks, you know, it's this environment that's used to really slow changes. And if you accelerate the amount of carbon that's going into that environment, it is uh, going to be disturbing the balance that exists in that system between the microbes, between the animals, between the geochemistry. Uh, and that could, in some cases, cause more nitrous oxide or methane to come out of those seafloor sediments. It could cause expansion of oxygen minimum zones. It could cause acidification. There's a lot of impacts that could come from that. And so we just need to make sure that with everything, we are doing the proper research to understand what the impacts of anything like that would be and making sure that the cost benefit analysis adds up. OK, thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to ask a question to Veronica um, before she leaves <clears throat> for the airport. Uh, so within the framework of the UN decade in particular, we're very interested in engaging with stakeholders and users and indigenous communities, for example. Um, but it's something that scientists and academics uh, struggle with and don't really necessarily know where to start. So. Um, what, what would you give as advice to start that conversation with, with your stakeholders to generate more participation in marine conservation product, projects? Yeah, thank you for your question. I mean, I don't have the answer. Like, um, there is no uh, single answer for that. The, um, the main idea is to open a bit our minds and also start to think about with whom we are working. So not only with scientists, but also with the people that live there. Because sometimes I feel like we do a lot of helicopter science. We go to a place, we take data, and we 
come to our research labs and we publish our papers. But the people that are living there, that they are fishing there, that they are of course suffering from deep sea, sometimes um, loss of biodiversity, are not, we are not communicating to them our results. So I will say that the first step is to know where we are going, where is our research going to impact, and also how to communicate to the people that live there. Um, and once we understand that we are not doing this just for ourselves, I think we will start to work together with the community and with the entire world. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you for having me here. I need to leave, apologies. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we have a question at the back and one in the middle. So the microphone's at the back. It's working. Okay. Sorry, just one final question. My name is Penny. I'm with the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, 18 countries in the Pacific. Just a question to Veronica. Veronica, you mentioned there is no systemic way where we can organize ourselves to do carry out uh, observations. Um, what will this problem create, create 10 years down the line? I mean, all regions are doing Earth observations. Uh, those that can afford it are uh, continuing with that work. But um, I just see a problem here. But we'll reach 10 years down the line and we'll realize that maybe the methodology approach is different or maybe you know, some countries are doing it and some countries are not. I, I'm just interested, and one final sub-question, uh, where do you think, if that, is, if that is something to be addressed, where do you think that can, which forum can address that? Thank you. One way to address this, I will say like, we also need the, um, the format to include the people and the pattern. Of course, we are dealing with people, so everyone is different. Everyone has a multicultural background, and we are from different places. Um, but we, I feel like we are still in a baby stage integrating the communities because we talk about a methodology, biological methodology, geography, geology, but we sometimes forget about the social aspects. And one thing that could help is best practices. So if we will all try to, the people that work with people, like social scientists, and will try to incorporate these best practices, we will start to have more of a way to know how to work with coastal communities also. So I think it's a part, a lack of sharing these best practices. And also, sometimes we are afraid. We are afraid because, you know, sometimes like, okay, ethics, or, you know, you are at the end dealing with people. Um, but we shouldn't be afraid anymore. Like, we are all people, and the coastal communities are also like us. Um, we want a better place. So I think we should live apart this, the, this uh, idea of being afraid or not sharing. And this will be the first part for integration of this data. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> I was interested by the, uh, what you said about the need to develop uh, deep sea observation. I do support this idea. Um, I understand also that there is a need for technological development in this area. Um, but um, my question is, do you share this idea that the deep sea biology community is quite limited in terms of size? And if so, what would be the possibilities uh, beyond technological development to, to attract more people? Because my fear is that we are facing a, 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 a huge problem with only a few people. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, yes, there are rather few deep sea biologists and it's largely a issue of funding as much as anything because a lot of people are fascinated and maybe would consider uh, studying this area. But you know, the examples I gave of Seabed 2030 or the Argo program have worked for decades to build up a community and create an international 
observing effort. And um, while the deep sea biology community is very well networked in terms of talking, you know, and, and, um, and meeting together and exchanging ideas, it's much harder to find the resources to establish integrated observing systems. I mean, there are, you know, your institution has a great observing system. There are many different ones out there, um, but there's still few and far between for um, the vast area of the deep sea and the heterogeneity and diversity of the deep ocean. So, um, it, you know, I haven't thought hard about what that solution is, but I know that it, it, it's some combination of a scientific will and uh, funding and resources. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, we have another question here. Thank you very much. Uh, Wasim Vuk from the University of Southampton. Um, my question is about multidisciplinarity, um, and I want to pick your brain on it. And I, I mean, I wish we weren't living in a world where everything is dependent on money. You know, and when we're talking about informing policy makers, unfortunately, a lot of the times they would need to see the numbers for them to take action. So my question to you is how much, how much need do you think there is for interdisciplinarity specifically when we're talking about the, the, the deep, deep oceans and in particular working with uh, economists, for example, who would be able to put a price tag to on, on the blue economy and that would facilitate decision making. I know that we've spoken about existing frameworks, but for real action to be taken, I think there's, I don't know, I'd, I'd like to hear your views on, on the, the value of multidisciplinarity in your area in particular. Uh, okay, I'm an economist and I'm uh, working with a biologist. Uh, in fact, in my lab, uh, they are all biologists and uh, I'm only the one in the economic section. Uh, so how we do the, 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 the valuation, the ecosystem services valuation? We need the science, we need to understand what the, the biologists are telling us and uh, then we try to evaluate those ecosystem services. Uh, there are different methodologies to do that, uh, but we cannot without a sound science. Concerning the deep sea, the problem for the moment is that we don't know exactly all the science behind, so it is difficult to give a specific number. For the moment also, we know that most of the value coming from the deep sea is mostly extractive, because we, we are taking, we can take what is in the ocean, so we can give it a value, uh, but we have to consider the system completely differently and to consider uh, that uh, protecting the deep sea can also bring something in a uh, nature positive uh, value. So this, this is something important. Even if the deep sea doesn't really belong to one country, it belongs to all of us, uh, it, I think we really need it to protect our planet and our well-being. Okay, so, Sonny Gitu, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, thank you. That was a, an excellent question. Currently, the um, United Nations Statistic Department has released some framework on statistical uh, economic for ecosystem services assessment. Now with the natural capital accounting which the World Bank is currently working on, we also have what is known as the ocean account. But the challenge we have currently is that you cannot have one cap to fit all. So you now need the scientists, the economists, and the politicians because that's why the politicians are also making mistakes, giving concession to the exploration of what they don't have a better idea and the impact is quite huge. Just like what is happening with the climate transition now is also going to affect the deep ocean if we are not careful. 
So we need to start discussing and have a better platform for all the stakeholders to have better idea. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I have a follow-up question actually to that. So we're talking about valuing ecosystem services, but I'm wondering if there have been any studies of the, uh, the, the value of the observations, the biological observations, in, in the same way that there have been studies of the economic value of um, physical observations for things like weather forecasting and you know, or the economic losses that can be avoided by weather forecasting. Is there anything like that that's been done for biology, biological observations? Um, I can take two, two examples. For example, we, we have a project on the Mediterranean Sea and uh, we have observed that due to climate change and uh, the, the global warming, the fishes are going up and they are going from the south of the Mediterranean to the northern part of the Mediterranean, meaning that uh, the, the developing countries in the south will have less uh, fish. And uh, they are already underdeveloped, so uh, underdeveloping, we'll say. And, uh, and uh, they are already vulnerable to climate change. So they will lose this uh, revenue coming from, uh, from the fisheries. Uh, another example is uh, the study that, that uh, is doing with the uh, Mary Foundation in Chile. They have the Blue Boat Initiative and with acoustic, they can, uh, um, they, they can protect the whales uh, th from the collisions with the ships. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I also have a question for Margaret uh, about Obon. So you mentioned that all of the uh, stations where bi um, biomolecular observations are being made are coastal at the moment. It's still a, a young program. Um, so how will Obon understand the relationship between climate change and biodiversity in the open ocean? Well, I think that, that uh, actually one of the more challenging areas for us to understand because it is so regional uh, is the impact on coastal environments. So we have, uh, we have individual surveys that have been done, uh, for example, uh, in uh, uh, in the Western Channel Observatory, uh, the MBA looks at, they have been uh, monitoring biomolecular uh, uh, aspects of biodiversity for some time, and they're also monitoring uh, physical change. And so we have individual places like that where this has taken place, but it's been much harder to, uh, to put that together into a, a you know, a larger regional or, or global assessment of the, the total impact on coastal environments. Uh, so I think that although uh, the, the existing stations are just coastal, that's going to be very important for us to be able to do that. And then uh, as we ind indicate, we have observations of biomolecular uh, uh, change in the, the open ocean, but we don't have time series stations there yet. And so that's something yet to come. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, there's a question in the audience. And may I just ask also if it's possible to unmute our online speaker in case he wants to make, I think he was trying to, to respond to an earlier question. Uh, please go ahead. Thanks. Can you, oh, there we go. Um, thank you very much. My name is Louis Salier from the German um, Climate, Service, uh, Climate Service Center in Germany. My, my question, I think, goes to Lisa. And given the slow process of declaring marine protected areas um, and the fact that we've already heard that we can expect major biophysical changes in the, in the ocean environment, and particularly the areas beyond national jurisdiction, should we not 
be planning marine protected areas for where they will be in 50 years time as opposed to where they are now. Um, how do we protect what we want to have in 50 years time and what does that mean for international policy? Um, well, the short answer is yes, we should. I'm a big advocate of using the knowledge we have and the modeling skills we have, which can now predict somewhat what conditions will be in the future. And we can do this 20 years in the future, or we can do this 100 years in the future, and we know that conditions will change and species distributions will track those changes. So I'm a been advocating for some time now that we build um, the climate projections and the habitat suitability modeling that tells us where deep sea corals will be, can and can't live, you know, in the future. We, of course, we don't know what the emission scenarios will be following, but we can guess and we can create envelopes for species of possible ranges. Um, now, how to convince organizations who are designing MPAs to do this is much more difficult. Traditionally, the biodiversity and conservation community has been very separate from the climate and climate modeling community. So I think it's really important to, to bring those two together. We see very little attention in the Convention on Biological Diversity or the BBNJ negotiations to climate and we see very little attention you know, to biodiversity in the UNFCCC negotiations, ocean biodiversity. So um, I think you're exactly right that this need, needs to be uh, a focus and maybe we need to think about new ways to bring those communities together. Um, but I think we will have to get work through the UN bodies uh, that deal with the ocean to do it. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, no questions from the virtual audience? I don't know no, who's monitoring those. I'm, I'm telling you. Oh, okay, no. thank you. Uh, there's a question at the back. Uh, oh, okay, here and then. Thank you. Um, I have a question perhaps for Ms. Seabrook, um, which is about if you have a take on deep sea mining of nodules that have these, you know, rare earth minerals um, and I'm wondering if you think that getting those minerals is more important for um, keeping emissions lower by having uh, more minerals for battery usage, et cetera, um, or if it's more important to preserve those um, uh, microbiomes around the nodules. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It is certainly something that we've heard spoken about a lot here at COP27 of uh, the potential and the uh, potential implications of seabed mining. I think when I think about this, I think about the precautionary principle and, and that's this idea, right, that uh, we, in any environmental assessment, if we don't have enough research to know what the impact of something would be, then we should hold off on doing it until we have enough research to be able to do a proper holistic solid environmental impact assessment. If we have mining on land, which as we know is where most of our resources are coming from now, there is extensive exhaustive environmental impact assessments that occur and there's a lot of research that is able to show what the impacts will be, they're able to do cost benefit analyses, they're able to make plans for mitigation and remediation after the mining and that is not possible in the deep sea right now because we do not have enough data and so I think scientifically we have a lot of research that needs to be done before we would be able to do a solid enough environmental impact assessment where we could know that the impacts of mining would not be too great for us to consider doing it. There is also a lot of potential in the technologies that already exist. There's new battery technologies that are coming out that could be used in our transition to cleaner energy. There's possibilities of recycling a lot of material, and so I think it's important we consider all options and that we remain precautionary in our approach to any new endeavors. Okay, thank you. Uh, question at the back. Uh, 
sorry, uh, Natalie, do you want to respond to the previous question? Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to add something about mining because we, we talk a lot about, uh, a bit <laughs> about mining, but that is also, you know, the ice is melting in the Arctic and 15% of the world reserve of oil and 30% of the gas uh, reserves of the uh, globally are in the Arctic. So the, I, the ice is melting because of climate change and many countries are just waiting to go and uh, take it. So there is not only mining but also uh, fossil fuels that are in the deep sea as well. Thank you. Okay, okay. my concern goes to the last presentation. Uh, if you consider the fact that uh, there is always a shift in the baseline, there is always a shift in the baseline. For example, the challenge we are facing as we conservationists, the way the changes were happened, the, 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 the way the things were 20, 40, 40 years back, they are totally different from the way things are. The generation which existed years back has a different baseline from what this new generation is seeing. And this new generation, what it is seeing today is its baseline. So how are you going to handle the younger generation leaders who are living today and to come, who are going to find a totally different um, uh, baseline? Hmm? And they ha you remember we, we want to conserve the original, the former, which is presumed to be the better environment. So how are you looking into that? A new generation finds a new set of conditions which for it considers to be the baseline. Thank you. Hope you've got my concern. Yes, I did. Thank you so much. When you talk about previous generation or older generation, first you need to understand classification within uh, the global community. So I know you're coming from the perspective of the African setting. Now, the quality of education that was assimilated within the African setting did not put the structure that the global north had. So, for example, you do not have a clear social security framework that enables citizens of the global south to identify themselves and get secured in their country. Now, the flow of information, the quality of education that is also derived within the global south is quite different from that in the global north. So things are more coordinated, well structured in the global north and there is a proper transition. Now in the global south, a lot of our older generation did not have information transferred to the new generation. And you could see that the younger generation in Africa if just like uh, a previous question about everything is money, money. The young generation in Africa, instead of sitting back in Africa to look at opportunities on how to harness and frame the future, they are migrating. And you look at the migration illegally. So these are ele levels that need to be properly consolidated. And that's why I'm soliciting from our brothers and sisters from the global north to look at a proper framework. Before we had a classification of least developed country, you see discussions are supposed to happen at that level, but it doesn't. So they all come to a very high intelligent uh, set of persons from the global to have discussion and the only rubber stamp. So whatever is said there, it's what they adopt. So now, the impact on us is we are having overload of information and we do not know which one to assimilate. And that's why we get more confused rather than having a pathway that clearly gives us a roadmap. So we now need to sit back and look at where we are and how to move. So what, one other critical problem that is also affecting us, look at our population growth. Look at the United Kingdom population growth over the years. And you see that there is a clear understanding for proper planning and proper implementation of things. But down here, the population growth is rapid because everybody wants to have kids, but doesn't want to care on the quality. So these are elements that we need to sit back, 
and start looking at how we can effectively work on it. If not, the climate transition is going to be so disastrous, especially it has already been stated by the scientists. Look again at the digitalization of the global system. In the infrastructure in the global north is different from the infrastructure in the global south. And we are not doing anything. Most of the global south philanthropists or the government officials take the resources and go to stack somewhere rather than use that resources to develop a system that can help them mitigate and adapt the current challenges we are having. I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no more questions from the audience? No. Um, I have a, a question for Sarah. Um, many climate impacts in the deep ocean are hard to measure or are occurring to systems that we have no baseline data for, going back to the issue of baselines. Um, so how can we incorporate these unknowns into policy action and who should be involved in doing this? Thank you for the question. I will reflect a little bit on what I said earlier about the precautionary principle. There are a lot of unknowns, but those unknowns should be considered in the policy development. Um, if the unknowns cannot be addressed, then we shouldn't move forward with actions um, until we can expand research, expand observations in a way that can enable us to um, be more responsible in our decision making in environments. I, I think one thing that will be really important moving forward, um, bridging on Sani Gitu's um, response earlier, is the inclusion also of the Global South with the Global North decision making that happens for a lot of these larger processes and the inclusion of indigenous perspective and indigenous knowledge in the development of policies. And by that I mean the co-development, the co having indigenous observers in the room, having indigenous scientists in the room when the decisions are being made. Um, because even in the deep ocean, we have a lot of knowledge that can be gained from indigenous perspectives that could help inform better management and more holistic um, uh, caretaking of, of the environments moving forward. Okay, thank you. And uh, Lisa, um, can you give us some examples of policy actions that encompass marine biodiversity and climate solutions? Sure, I, I would say a really good example is bottom trawling, which occurs on continental margins. It releases carbon which is not good for the climate system or the carbon cycle, but it also destroys the, uh, what we call ecosystem engineers, the three-dimensional coral and sponge gardens on our mountains and sea mount, uh, margins and seamounts. And those habitats provide um, nursery ground and food and enhance biodiversity of the deep sea. So by banning trawling, um, especially in deep water where things recover very slowly, we can benefit both biodiversity and the climate. And there have been some new laws to ban trawling um, passed by the EU and by others. So deep water trawling, say below 600 meters is, is now becoming a thing of the past in many places. Okay, thank you. And a final question for Sonny Gitu. Um, the UN Ocean Decade has a very strong capacity development focus, but do you think enough is being done by the decade programs to engage with and support developing countries and early career ocean professionals? Thank you for that excellent question. Yeah, the decade was endorsed in 2021, so measuring um, the impact, I could say they are trying, uh, but they need more work because the ECOPNOP is being established across uh, the continent to encourage capacity building. But what I expect more from it is to have a comprehensive national stakeholder mapping so that they know who they are dealing with. Because we have a whole lot of challenges where nations who get a dozen commitments but they get back home, we have no means of tracking those commitments at local level Yet, the report at the global level and the scenario on ground is not similar to the scenario that they are reporting. So we need to have 
a way, especially with the improvement in digitalization, to be able to track a whole lot of things. I went to the UK uh, pavilion. I was amazed. They have a digital globe, and they could give you information on emission uh, and so many other details, inclusive of video. And this is amazing. So the question back would be, what are the efforts the UN is doing to monitor transition, especially in the global south? Thank you. OK. Thank you. So we're nearing the end of the session. Um, I'd just like to finish on a positive note. And I'm going to ask all the panelists to give us a message of hope for the future. Um, so just very briefly, could each of you tell us what we can do collectively to improve the outlook for marine ecosystems from the coastal down to the deep ocean by the end of this decade? Maybe we'll start at the far end and work our way towards me. Thank you. We need to continue the discussion and coordinate trust building so that we can move forward. Thank you. Um, I would like to see a successful negotiation for the Biodiversity Treaty in the High Seas and a way for all the different UN bodies to work together to make that effective. Climate change is impacting our nature, but also nature can be part of the solution. So if um, we can uh, give a value to this natural capital, Maybe we can bring the government and the private sector to work together to protect our nature and our planet. This is supposed to be the implementation COP, and we're supposed to see a lot of cuts in emissions happening by 2030. And I would really like to see that by 2030, we're in a position where the better IPCC scenarios that we can see in the graphs, we can see in the figures, that we're on track for those. We're on track for a lower emissions future and a healthier ocean that has less deoxygenation, less acidification, and is not as warm. Final word. Well, I think that, that one of the keys for us to be successful is to be able to measure that success and to be able to demonstrate that the tools that we put in place, whether those are policy tools or sampling tools or uh, social interaction tools are working. And, uh, and one of the things that makes me very optimistic is this explosion of new capabilities to actually look at the biology. She, our, our online speaker has just reminded me that that shouldn't be the final word, but uh, is it possible to get, unmute him so he, he can have the final word? Yeah. 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 Thanks, Sophie. So, sorry about yeah. that. No, no, it's okay. It's, it's, uh, I'm disembodied. Um, yeah, so from, from our side, I think we're getting, we are getting our data together, and that is a very important uh, legacy to leave behind. That is a voice that will keep sending a message through time. And the more structured we get it, the more um, tuned we get it to the ears that are listening, the more we can represent the needs of life on this planet. OK. Thank you. I'd like to thank all our speakers. <laughs>